Welcome to the Bible study on Ephesians. I'm so glad that you've decided to join us. You know, it's going to remind us Christians that we are among the richest individuals in town. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're rich in material possessions. We're rich in spiritual possessions. When we accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, we were born into God's family. So we have a sizable inheritance. Some Christians don't know how wealthy we are. They've never even read this letter and grasped what it means. It's like money in the bank. It doesn't do us any good unless we know it's there and draw on it. In Ephesians, Paul is writing to tell us believers about the wealth we have in Christ so we'll know exactly what we've inherited and can draw on it. The best part is that this inheritance is not only for this life, it's also for the life to come. It's going to last for all eternity. Someone has said that it's impossible to read Ephesians and be depressed. So I hope we'll be encouraged as we go over this book. Let's open with prayer. And Father, we do praise you as our provider. We thank you for providing this Bible study for us. We pray that you will bless it and use it to accomplish your purposes. Thank you for the way that you used Paul in the city of Ephesus to make Christ known to others. And we pray that you'll open our eyes to the truths that you have for us today and help us to apply them to our lives. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, first I want us to just look at the background to the book. We'll know a little bit about the people to whom Paul is writing. The story is told in Acts 19 and 20. Paul visited Ephesus, the area now known as Turkey, on his third missionary journey. Ephesus was one of the wealthiest cities in the Mediterranean world. It had a magnificent library and a stadium that could seat 24,000 people. My husband and I were privileged to go there several years ago. The ruins are still standing. They give us an idea of what a beautiful and prosperous city it was. I want to summarize parts of Acts 19 and 20 that tell us about Paul's experience there. So just sit back and try to visualize what happened. Acts 19 tells us that when Paul arrived in Ephesus, he began to tell the people about Jesus. He didn't waste any time. Right away, he began to share the good news. I'm grateful it was that way in my life. Shortly after I was born, I began going to the nursery at our church. One of the first songs I ever learned was, Jesus Loves Me. I grew up knowing that God loves me. I'm grateful for the Sunday school teachers who told me about Jesus from the time that I was a baby. I'm glad they didn't waste any time. Because of that early tr training, it was easy for me to accept Jesus Christ as my Savior when I was 10 years old. Several years ago, the church that I grew up in celebrated its 100th anniversary. Jim and I went back to Dillon to take part in it. During the service, the pastor asked us to take a few minutes and thank the Lord for those who had been faithful to pass along the good news to us. So I sat there in the pew thanking the Lord for those who shared with me, silently mentioning their names. Ms. Marvin, Mr. Clardy, Mr. Garrison, Dr. Rast, Dr. Cook, and many others. I'm grateful that they told me about Jesus. If you're a Christian, I'm sure that you're grateful for the ones who told you about Jesus also. It could have been your pastor or Sunday school teacher, your parents or a friend. Whoever it was, I know that you're grateful that they cared enough for you to share the good news. I've known a number of people like Paul who didn't waste any opportunities. 
Some of you may remember a minister from Fort Mill named Ed Whalen. Mr. Whalen didn't waste any opportunities. My husband Jim grew up in Fort Mill and Mr. Whalen was his pastor. About 10 years after we were married, Jim's mother, Ms. Ardry, called us one Sunday and told us that we might be getting a call from the Whalens. They had gone on a trip, they were on their way back home, and would be passing through Jackson, Mississippi, where we lived at the time. Well, sure enough, about the middle of the afternoon, we got a call. They were on the outskirts of town and asked if they could come by and visit. So we assured them that we'd love to have them come by, and we invited them to stay for supper. Well, I hurriedly looked in the freezer and found a few pieces of chicken, which I put in the oven, and found some things in the refrigerator to make salad. After they arrived and we'd visited for a while, I went in the kitchen to start making a salad, and Mr. Whalen followed me. I was standing there cutting up carrots and lettuce and tomatoes, and he said, well, Louise, when did you accept Jesus? He wanted to be sure that I knew the Lord. So I began to tell him about my love for the Lord and my desire to serve him. Mr. Whalen didn't waste any opportunities. I appreciated that, and I admire that. My sister-in-law, Lydia, didn't waste any opportunities either. Soon after she would meet someone, she would ask in her sweet voice, have you found a church home yet? If not, we'd love to have you visit our church. She loved the Lord, and she wanted other people to know him and love him too. For 15 years, she gave a devotional every week over at Westminster Towers Health Center in Manor. Her mother, Madeline Ardry, accepted the Lord as an adult. She was about 40 years old when she heard a visiting pastor to her church in Fort Mill and her heart was changed. She had gone to church regularly all her life, but she didn't know the Lord personally. She had never accepted him as her Lord and Savior. But once she did, she was never the same. She didn't waste any opportunities. She taught Bible studies for about 40 years, and she helped start a church there in Fort Mill. She'd pick up ladies who didn't have a car and take them to church. And she prayed every Sunday night with a friend for our family. I firmly believe that the Lord used those prayers to give me a deeper hunger to know Jesus and his word better. After her death, we found boxes of letters from missionaries with whom she had corresponded. We also found hundreds of tracts that she gave to people to tell them about Jesus. And that's what the Lord wants us to do, tell others about Jesus. We don't ever want to be offensive about sharing our faith. I like the advice that Peter gives us in 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16. He said, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. One thing that I've done occasionally is to ask someone, how would you describe your relationship with the Lord? That usually opens up a conversation about where they stand. Anyone who loves the Lord is going to be eager to tell you about their relationship. But if someone doesn't know the Lord, it gives us the opportunity to share with them. We can do that in a variety of ways. Invite them to church or to a Bible study, share with them over a cup of coffee, write them a letter, or give them a book or other information about becoming a Christian. When Paul shared with the people in Ephesus, many of them believed and Paul baptized them. Some of them had already received the baptism of John by a man named Apollos who had come to Ephesus. But Paul explained that John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. You remember in the Gospel of John, we're told that John the Baptist baptized people as a sign of repentance. But John told them to believe in the name of one coming after him, 
Jesus Christ. So Paul explained to them that Jesus had come and he baptized them into the name of the Lord Jesus. God used Paul in a mighty way to spread the word in the city of Ephesus. He spoke boldly in the synagogue for three months telling them about the kingdom of God. He told these fellow Jews about the prophecies concerning Jesus. He told them how the angel approached Mary and told her she would have a child and was to give him the name Jesus. Paul told them about Jesus' unique birth in a manger in Bethlehem, the very city that had been foretold in Scripture. He told them about Jesus' life and his miracles, how he healed the eyes of the blind, opened the ears of the deaf, healed lepers, and made the lame to walk. He told them how Jesus lived a life of perfect obedience, constantly doing the will of his Father. He told them about Jesus' crucifixion on the cross as a sacrifice for our sins, how he was resurrected from the dead, appeared to over 500 people at one time, ascended back into heaven, and how the angels told the disciples that he would come again one day. We can just imagine Paul's enthusiasm as he shared with his fellow Jews the good news that the Messiah, the one the prophets had written about, had finally come. This went on for three months and many believed. But some of the people became obstinate and refused to believe. You may know someone like that. Now, what do you think Paul did? Did he become discouraged and give up? No, he just moved to a different location. He took the disciples and went to the hall of Tyrannus. He held discussions in the lecture hall there every day for two years. During that time, all the Jews, as well as the Greeks who lived in the area, had the opportunity to hear the word of the Lord. And you know, there's a lesson in that for us. If someone rejects your message, just move on. We can't force people to accept Jesus. We can't argue with them. That doesn't work. In fact, it does more harm than good. So if someone rejects the message, just move on. God also did extraordinary miracles through Paul when he was in Ephesus. Illnesses were cured and evil spirits were driven out. About this time, some Jews who were the sons of a Jewish chief priest who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. And there's a lesson in that for us, isn't there? God had given Paul the power to cure illnesses and drive out evil spirits. But these men had not been given that power. Evil spirits are powerful. We mustn't ever forget that. But God is much, much more powerful. 1 John 4, 4 tells us, the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Jesus Christ, who is in all believers, is far greater than Satan and his evil spirits who are in the world. When this incident became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all fearful, and the name of the Lord was held in high honor. Many of those who believed came and openly confessed their evil deeds. A number of them who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. That was very significant 
because we're told in Deuteronomy 18, verses 9 through 12, that God told his people, when you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations there. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft, or casts spells, or who is a medium or spiritist, or who consults the dead. Anyone who does those things is detestable to the Lord. That is crystal clear. Sorcery is detestable to the Lord. Sorcery is the use of supernatural powers through the assistance of evil spirits, witchcraft, and black magic. So Christians are not to have anything to do with those things. In our day, that includes Ouija boards, tarot cards, horoscopes, or anything else like that. They are not simple toys and harmless things to entertain us. They are things that are detestable to the Lord because they tamper with evil spirits, which are very real. So the believers in Ephesus who had practiced sorcery were convicted and they burned their, their scrolls publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. Now, drachma was a silver coin worth about a day's wages. So burning things worth 50,000 drachmas was a big sacrifice on their part. But they wanted to get right with God. We're told that in that way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. That's what happens when people acknowledge their sins, confess them, and obey God's word. God's word spreads. And there's a lesson in that for us. When we accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, we're to get rid of things in our lives that are displeasing to him. That includes certain magazines, books, TV, movies, drugs, unhealthy habits, and other things that are against God's word. We can't expect to grow as Christians if we continue to live like non-believers. When we accept Jesus as Savior and Lord, we become new creations. So we are to be different. We are to change. We're to be obedient to God's Word. That's when the Word spreads and grows in power, when people see a difference in our lives. After this happened, a disturbance arose about Paul's ministry. Not everyone was happy about what was going on. There was a lot of idol worship in Ephesus. One of the goddesses who was worshipped was Artemis. A silversmith named Demetrius made silver shrines of the goddess Artemis. That brought in a lot of business for the craftsmen. So Demetrius called them together. He said, men, you know that we receive a good income from this business. And you see how this fellow Paul has led many people here in Ephesus. He has misled them in practically the whole province of Asia. He says that man-made gods are no gods at all. Now, Paul was pointing out something that's true for all time. There is only one true God. God's commandment in Exodus 20, verse 3 says, you are to have no other gods before me. That commandment holds true for all generations. But unfortunately, people do worship other gods today. They aren't necessarily images that they worship. It could be anything they put before God. It could be a job, exercise, relationships, material things like money, cars. Demetrius went on to say, 
there is danger that our trade will lose its good name. Not only that, the temple of the goddess Artemis will be discredited, and the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. Now these craftsmen were concerned that their pocketbooks were going to be affected, that people wouldn't buy their shrines anymore. So when they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. You know, a lot of people react that way to preaching and teaching today when it points out what they're doing wrong. They become angry. They won't accept it. Soon the whole city was in an uproar. A mob can get out of control in a hurry, can't it? We've seen that on TV. The people all rushed into the theater. Paul wanted to speak to the crowd, but the disciples wouldn't let him. Even some of the officials who were friends of Paul sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater because they feared for his life. Everything was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing and some another. We're told that most of the people didn't even know why they were there. A Jew named Alexander motioned for silence so he could speak to the people. But when they realized he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for two hours, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Finally, the city clerk quieted the crowd. He said, Men of Ephesus, doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis? Since these facts are undeniable, you ought to be quiet and not do anything rash. These men haven't robbed our temples or blasphemed our goddess. If Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a grievance against anybody, the courts are open and they can press charges. If there's anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled legally. As it is, we're in danger of being charged with rioting. In that case, we wouldn't be able to count for this commotion since there's no reason for it. And then he dismissed everyone. When the uproar ended, Paul sent for the disciples, told them goodbye, and set out for Macedonia. Sometimes after something like this, it's best to just let things calm down. So Paul left town. His presence could have kept the matter alive, and so he quietly left. He spent some time in Macedonia encouraging the people there, and then he went to Greece, where he stayed for three months. Paul wanted to go to Jerusalem next, but before he left, he sent for the elders of the church at Ephesus. He wanted to send them, see them one more time, so he arranged to meet them. Paul had stayed at Ephesus longer than any other place, and he loved these Christians deeply. The passage in Acts 20 that describes Paul's farewell to the elders is one of the most touching scenes in the New Testament. When the elders arrived, this is what Paul said to them. You know how I lived among you the whole time I was with you, from the first day I came into the province of Asia. I served the Lord with great humility and with tears, although I was severely tested by the plots of the Jews. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I've declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. That's how much Paul cared. I can just picture him going house to house, weeping as he shared the good news with them. Paul knew that danger lay ahead. He said, and now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison 
and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. That was Paul's goal in life, to complete the task the Lord Jesus had given him, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. We can imagine how he must have felt as he said, I know that none of you will ever see me again. Therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of all men. I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. And then Paul gave them this advice. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. And then Paul warned them. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even those from your own group will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples. So be on your guard. Paul knew that people would try to distort the truth. And that's been done in every generation. It's being done today. There are people today who've written books that try to disclaim the Bible and distort the truth. And they have deceived many. Our elders and pastors are shepherds of the church. They need to follow Paul's advice to keep watch and to be guard, on guard constantly against those who would distort the truth. We need to be on our guard also and carefully look at what people say in light of God's word, which never changes. Then Paul reminded them, remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you, night and day with tears. And Paul concluded, Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothes. You know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself, it is more blessed to give than to receive. That last statement is one of the most quoted verses in scripture. Jesus said it, and this is where it's recorded. Paul says that Jesus himself told him that. I think most of us would agree that it is more blessed to give than to receive. It does us good to give. It's a blessing to be able to give to others and help them. Now, picture this scene. We're told that when Paul had said this, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. And then they accompanied him to the ship. I can just picture that scene, can't you? That shows the love that Paul and the elders of the church in Ephesus had for one another. It's a wonderful story of how the church was established. As we study Paul's letter to the Ephesians, we can remember that these are some of the people to whom he's writing. I hope that each of us can say what Paul said. I want to finish the race and complete the task which Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. That was Paul's goal in life. Each one of us has been given that task, 
So that should be our goal in life also. You remember in Matthew 28, we're told that before Jesus ascended back into heaven, he told the disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely, I will be with you always to the end of the age. Those words are addressed to every Christian. The reason that we can obey that command is that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus, and he is with us. When he commands us to do something, he enables us. We don't do it on our own. In fact, we can't do it on our own. He enables us to teach others to obey what he's commanded us in his word. But in order to do that, we need to know his word so we can teach others. And that's why we're here today, isn't it? Next week, we're going to read the first chapter of Ephesians and answer the questions in the workbook. We're going to see what we have as Christians so we can draw on it and tell others. And next week, I hope you'll have your Bibles with you as well as your workbook because we're going to be going verse by verse. Paul was an ambassador for Christ in his day. And now, it's our turn. You and I are ambassadors for Christ wherever we are. In Rock Hill, Fort Mill, York, wherever God places us. Let's close in prayer. And Father, we do thank you for the people that you use to share the good news of Jesus with each of us. Thank you for showing us through this story how you used Paul to share the good news with the people in his day. Help us to do the same in our day, wherever you place us. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being a part of this. <laughs>